Hey everyone, today's guest is my old friend, Duncan Redmonds, lead vocalist and drummer for the Hendon England punk rock band, Snuff. Together we break down the writing, recording, and inspiration behind the fan favorite single, Nick Northern, taken from their 1996 album, Demamasabi Bunk. Snuff is one of my favorite bands and one of my earliest punk rock influences. I learned a bunch of stuff about this song today, things I've always wanted to ask Duncan, but would stop short as to not completely fanboy on him. This song is awesome. It combines the band's love of soul and mixes it with a healthy dash of punk rock and a melancholy lyric about the one who got away, something we can all relate to. It wasn't surprising to hear that the band would cut the main tracks, drums, bass, and guitars live, and then do overdubs. You can hear that immediacy in the track. I always wondered what Nick Northern meant, too. And I won't spoil it here, but it's perfect and very British. But that's not surprising, though, as Snuff has always been very tongue-in-cheek, another reason why I love the band so much. So for all this and a Greek landlord gone mad, stick around. This is a good one. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Duncan! How's it going, Chris? You alright? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. I've just had me bath and got spruced up, especially for the occasion. I love it. I love it. And uh, yeah, it's it's the afternoon over there for you right now. So you have afternoon bath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm a, I'm a gentleman of leisure when I'm not on tour. So uh, yeah, no, I was actually running around all morning. So uh, a quick bath just before I was going to get me dicky bow and a t- you know suit and tie on Sunday best. Didn't quite get there, but never mind. Nice. Well, you know, a lot of our listeners, Duncan, they were asking for you the past couple of years since we started this whole thing. And I had hit you up early on and you're just like, no, I'm not doing interviews right now. And a lot of people were like that during the pandemic. Just, they just kind of shut off. But you actually hit me up a couple of weeks ago and said, hey, I'd like to talk to you. And I was elated. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you as well. Yeah. No, I, I tend to shy away from interviews, to be honest. I've I find them a bit stressful sometimes. It's kind of more more nervy than I'm comfortable with, so I shy away from it. But I've kind of had a different change of plan, a little bit of education. Do, 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 do. <laughs> so I'm trying to embrace it. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I, I, I did all the heavy lifting for us here. So we're just going to we're just going to comb through uh, the song Nick Northern today. We'll get into that in a minute. But I just want to give everyone a, a little background, you know, and I, I know you know this, Duncan, but in 1990, I was given a cassette and it just said snuff, nothing else. And the flip side of it was the second record from the Goo Goo Dolls. And at the time, the Goo Goo Dolls were playing punk rock. And I had this cassette that I pretty much wore out. And you know, there was there was no Google to just be like, who's this band? I didn't know anything about it. I just knew the songs. And it was unlike anything I'd ever heard. I kind of gathered it was English by the accents and some of the in-between songs, the weird stuff that you guys would do. And that record was called Snuff Said. In 1993, I was on a spring break up in Philadelphia. Duncan, I had looked for this, this CD, this record for three years, okay? And I'm in this record store. This is probably, I'm not even kidding you, probably the, the hundredth record store I had walked in. All over Florida, I'd been combing record stores. I had been trying to find an imp couldn't find it and i'm in philly i walk in and there's a clerk behind the counter and i said how you doing he says great i said i'm looking for this it's obscure it's it's a record by a band called snuff he said snuff he says i just got a a, a cd in a, a used cd the other day he goes go look over there and i went and i said okay and I've, I've had this happen before and i walked over and it's it's not the right band or whatever and i look and i turn the record over and i start seeing the song titles not listening somehow and i'm like oh this is the band. This is the band. I plopped down the 10 bucks or whatever for it. And I finally had the record. And it wasn't long after that, that I found out that the band had gotten back together. I didn't even know you broke up. Uh, in between that, you did another record called Guns and Wankers. And I'm in a record store in Gainesville one day, thumbing through. And that voice comes over the PA, that unmistakable voice of Duncan. I'm like, who is this? So the guy's like, it's a band called Guns and Wankers. I'm like, it's got to be Duncan. I got the record. Of course it was. (laughs) 
And before I get too much more long-winded, I want to say one more thing to you. Doing this episode after almost 30 years, 33 years of, of knowing of your band, I I found out something, Duncan, that I'm, I'm really, really happy about. I did not know on February 20th of 1996 when you played Janice Landing with no effects, okay? And it was for this uh, record that Nick Northern is on, Demasibibunk. <laughs> Demasibibunk, yeah, yeah, yeah. Demasibibunk, which we'll get to that story later too, which is hilarious. Okay. But I didn't realize that I saw Andy that night on bass. He was with you then. Yeah, Andy was on bass that. If it was 96, it would have been Loz on guitar, Andy on bass. Um, was the mod with us on keyboards? Well, now, <laughs> when I went back to YouTube and I looked at videos from that time period, yes, he was on that. U- now, I didn't see one from Janice, La- Janice Landing where you played in Florida, but there was another video and Lee the Mod was there. I didn't think Lee joined you till the 2000s. So I'm learning stuff now. I can't believe that I'm, I'm just now figuring out. But uh, Andy, uh, Crichton, we lost Andy in, it, I believe, 99. He passed away. Yeah, boo-hoo. Yeah, and uh, he was the original bassist and stuff, but I, I just assumed that I saw Lee, uh, who had uh, taken over around a little bit after that. But that was really cool for me to be able to to know that I saw somebody from from the original lineup. And you know, your band changed my life. They have a trombone in the band, which that was a huge thing for Less Than Jake. We're like, wow, they're playing punk rock. They're not really doing the ska thing, but they have horns. And that's when we decided, uh, you know, to get the horn section. But take us back if you can. I, you know, you, you did the Guns and Wankers project, and then all of a sudden you decide to get Snuff back together. Were you approached by Fat Mike, or or was this already in uh, the wheels in motion for this reunion? Um, it was already in motion. We we split up ninety one. Um, it was all getting a bit ratty. Um, then I went off and did Guns and Wankers, and then that sort of went for a few years. But people weren't quite getting Guns and Wankers. It was sort of Hard work. It was getting there, but not really catching. Um, so that kind of just sort of tailed off in a way. And then I started doing something with Cy, original guitarist again. And we asked Andy, but I didn't think he was going to join. It, it was he was by then he was living up north. It was sort of like, will Andy do it? I don't think he will, but might as well ask. And then he he said, yeah, all right. So the original lineup was back together for about a year. The original lineup was together. Then Cy left. And then it then Loz came in, but um, but Fat Mike was involved in it because we weren't going to call it Snuff. We were going to call it something else. We thought let's just make a break and do other stuff. And I wanted to add key. Trombone had been in the band since like eighty nine, ninety, but that was kind of part time where he could turn up. Um, so that wasn't full time, but he would. He was there when it was, you know, when he could. But I wanted to add brass and keys full time. I wanted to make it a five piece. So we were just thinking, okay, let's make a break. And then Fat Mike came in and bribed us and said, well, you got to call it snuff. I was like, nah. <laughs> And he says, how about some filthy lucre? And we said, yeah, all right. <laughs> there you go. Money talks, right? Yeah, it spoke to us, and we were bribed and corrupted into doing it as snuff again. So it became snuff. I've talked to him about your band uh, till I'm I was I'm blue in the face and just we we both feel the same thing. It's like you started in '86. I mean, you were right there during the whole punk scene, what was going on in England. But your sound was just, I mean, it was it was part Motown, part soul, but part there was the pistols in there. You could hear all these different, you know, and did it surprise you at all? You know, of course, Green Day and Offspring and Rancid were kind of hitting in America, but all of a sudden these bands are popping up and I'm going, they sound like snuff, but I don't even know if they ever heard of snuff. Like you pioneered this sound. Uh, um, well, it's nice of you to say that, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure there was a few bands around the world that were popping up with similar ideas. But I think, the soul thing is definitely an influence and all the punk thing. I was into punk as a, at an early age, as a young teenager. Although I admit the punk records were at the back behind the heavy metal albums at the time, but you know, you could find the clash and the x-ray specs at the, at the back and slowly the, uh, 
the punk albums came to the front and the metal ones went to the back. I'm glad you mentioned that because the metal records, that, that metal sounds, a very, especially like, you know, all your records. But I remember the instrumental on Reach, that track. I was like, what is this? It's like you guys would break into stuff like that. And it was just so cool. Hellbound. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah, Hellbound. Yeah, well, we brought in whatever influences we enjoyed playing. So there was like the original style punk. There was the thrash punk, which was more my era, to be honest. I had the, like I said, the Clash Pistols, X-Ray Specs, etc. But then when I started hearing the likes of GBH and Discharge and Exploited, it was like, oh, now we're talking. Now we're talking. So that was sort of my mid-late teenage that's that's my special time because I I was too young on the first wave. I was like twelve in seventy six, but I remember it all. I remember getting the first Clash album for Christmas and going, "Well, that's all right. Garage Land's all right, but what? Why don't they do some sort of bit heavier? Be a bit heavier." And then they came out with "Give Them Enough Rope," which I thought was brilliant. And all the punks said, "No, nah, it's too rock." And I was like, "No, no, 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 no it's brilliant." Well, I got to tell you, the first, the, that time I saw you, and, and real quick, Demamasa Babunk <laughs> was released on February 13th of 1996. It was one week later, Tuesday, February 20th, that I saw you. And I drove down from Gainesville. It was me, Roger, and Vinny, and I think our roadie, Sean, right there in the front row. So I would have been right in front of Andy because Laz was always on stage left at that point. And I'm sitting there and I know that there was credits inside the records, but you were always changing your name. We were actually responsible, I think, for one of it because you used to call your brother Dave Redmonds, who plays trombone, War Dave. And with your uh, with your Cockney accents, we thought you were saying Gordy. That, that's right. Yeah, Gordy. I think in one of the records you put Gordy, trombone. So I never knew people's names, the correlations of instruments. I'm looking and going, there's that voice sitting yeah, behind yeah. the drum set. Like, it's like the Phil Collins of punk rock. <laughs> yeah, w- War Dave. <laughs> actually, it's not actually Cockney. It's more like it came from a Welshman, War Dave. But up north, they'd say our Dave, our, you know, but it was kind of a Welsh accent. And that just stuck as a little name. But yes, yeah. Gordy. You lot kept calling him Gordy. So we just thought, <laughs> okay, we'll join in. <laughs> so he's Gordy. That's all right. One more thing before, before, and I want to jump in, jump into the track, but you know, I grew up on a, a healthy dose of Benny Hill, the young ones, right? My grandfather loved Benny Hill and that English wacky slapstick humor. And I know that's one of the reasons less than Jake went down so well early on, you know, we were dressing up and doing this stuff and the, and, and the, the UK crowds completely got us. But that was the other thing about your band that I loved is you could write very just great lyrics and melodies and heartfelt, but then you could break into a commercial, you know, or something ridiculous or just like a jingle that, that you would do. And I always loved that. And, and and I took that with me. Our band took that with us and always tried to, you know, the, to have fun. That was paramount. Yeah. Well, it's always good to make fun of yourself in a way. We never wanted to be that serious. We always wanted to have fun anyway. Right. We started off doing it for fun, purely. Of course, we wanted to be world famous superstars, but early on, we just we didn't actually think anyone would like it because no one was particularly into that at the time. It was all the UK punk scene had kind of gone from GBH discharge into blast beats with extreme noise terror and the likes, where it was all five hundred miles an hour, double you know double beats. <laughs> all crusty, all blah, 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 blah. and there's very little sense of fun in it. I mean, I did, don't get me wrong, I liked, I liked that stuff, but we kind of wanted to put some of the melody back into it and have a bit of fun because I think one of the lessons of punk rock is it you, really you're just a punk on stage, you're nothing special. So it was like try and make that, give that feeling that we're, we ain't anything special really, we're just having a laugh, you know, it's not a... sure. Not a big egotistical thing going on here. It's we're having a laugh. So 
we try to put that in. And I think it also helps when you've got a lighthearted moment because it, it, it just changes it. it. It changes people's emotions. It's sort of a, um, and you mentioned adverts. If we did adverts, that was, I mean, back then there was no internet. Everyone watched the same things. Yeah. So every, everyone knew all the adverts on telly because everyone, that's, everyone saw it. So if you plugged into that public consciousness, everyone knew. It was like a little, ah, oh, they're being, they're being funny here, but this is still powerful, blah, blah, blah. So I don't know. Yeah, we tried to put that in there. Have a have a laugh and make it slightly lighthearted. I love that. You know, I saw Faith No More before they became superstars, and same thing. They they used to do the Nestle uh, chocolate commercial live, and right. I'll never forget that. Like they had this set, and they're coming out, and you you think they're serious for the first three or four songs, and they bust into this. You're like, what's going on? And you're right. It's a mood changer. It's like, okay, everyone kind of lets their guard down. We don't all have to be tough guys here. Yeah, and also just to make something happen different. We'd always try and do that, even if it's just a little bit of banter with the crowd or some little joke song from the town they come from or whatever it is, some sort of connection there so that it makes it a bit bit more connected somehow. Right. Well, you know, prolific is one word that comes to mind when I think of, of you. You've written so many great songs with Snuff, with Guns and Wankers, uh, with Billy No Mates, uh, your, your solo stuff that you, you do in Japan. But uh, this track, Nick Northern, was it written for uh, Demamasa Bibonk or was it something that you, you had had uh, held over from Guns and Wankers or anything else? It was written in, yeah, in the period when we got back together. It just came out. It actually came out of an old soul record in the UK. Like there's a, a whole sort of soul scene called the Northern Soul scene, which is basically the sounds like Motown, but the songs weren't hits. It's all the songs that never made it, but some of them are amazing. It's, it's, I don't know, understand how some of them weren't hits, but it's the, all the tracks that you know um, that didn't make it. Sounds like upbeat four tops it's that kind of stuff in general yeah and i was always into that i love me scooters and i love me northern soul and the soul and bit of scar and so it kind of came out it was plagiarized off an old northern soul record which to be honest i don't even know what it was i had it on cassette and it had this middle eight that just dropped down into it and and it was like oh if i change that about a little bit mm. and then it, it came from that, adding the keys and the brass, Andy's bass line, walking all over the place, and then sort of soulful lyrics about, you know, broken hearted stuff. All the soul songs, it's always about broken hearts, or I'm in love, or you broke my heart, or et cetera, or I'm going to break your heart. If Is that where the title comes from, Nick Northern, because of the Northern Soul? Yeah, so it came from Nick, if you nick something in English slang. Hey, you steal that, it. That's stealing, yeah, and nicked yeah. it. So it's basically nicked a Northern Soul vibe. So <laughs> I mean, the riff isn't exactly the same, and one day I'll hear it again, or someone will go, that sounds like Nick Northern by Snuff. Yeah. <laughs> and I go, what's, what's the title? Because I, I only ever had it on cassette. I don't know what it was. So right. It wasn't a big song on the scene. It was I don't know, a compilation CD that um, – so, yeah, basically, Nick Northern stole soul music, basically. That is so cool. I, I have no idea, and I've been listening to this song for 27 years now, 20, 26 years. But 27 years, geez, I'm bad at math. You know, when I got the EP, Flibbity Dibbity Dob, from you guys, and same thing, I'm in a record store in Gainesville, I'm thumbing through, and I see this thing, it was an EP by Snuff, but it had like hearts or something and like clouds on the cover. And I'm like, this is probably some EDM band from Germany or something. And I turn it over and I'm like, Ugh. so I plop down the seven or eight bucks or whatever it was for it. And I get home and I put it in and you did a cover of, I can see clearly now. I can see clearly now the way that I Right, that'll be Reach. Oh, that was Reach. Okay. I, yeah. Well, the, anyways, the EP had, I think, Soul Limbo. Is that what it's called? Uh, yeah. The Booker T and the MGs cover. And when you got 
guys would break into stuff like that live. And, and I got to, again, relive that when I watched that video from 96 last night. And I remember... I hadn't thought of this since that show. I saw you in, in, in Florida, but I remember the crowd changing when you went to that song. You played four songs, and then when you go into Soul Limbo, now everyone's, you know, you hit them with that. You, they reacted to that. There's something about that groove when you guys go into it that's powerful. Yeah, well, it does. Yeah, it's a, well, we kind of put an African style rhythm on it. I mean, the original Soul Limbo is kind of funky, shuffly kind of changed it a little bit but yeah when the crowd crowds love that as a live song all of a sudden people lighten up and go all right all right we'll have a little dance now here we go right yeah well and this song this song has always reminded me of that song but they're they're light years from each other diff way different feel with the guitar and nick northern it's not as danceable as that one but i still get that soul vibe right yeah well yeah soul and mod i was i was uh, influenced by that since i don't know up until i was 15 i probably only 14 15 it was 80 percent rock 20 percent punk yeah then come I, I left i moved to london when i was 17 and then i started hearing other stuff i'd never heard before this mod stuff and um small faces and booker t and the mgs it was like oh what's this what's this what's this and also the motown stuff i'd, I'd heard a few things before I remember me auntie Barbara brought around a Motown compilation when I was when I was a young and it was like, wow, what's this? What's this? What's this? Yeah, it's that double snare beat of Motown that just translated yeah. so well to punk rock. <laughs> yeah, you know? four on the floor, bam, bam, yeah. bam, bam, bam. Get, the, bam. get that tambourine with it, and we got a party. Yeah, tambourine, some lovely backing vocals, harmonies, lyrics that you know kind of hits everyone's everyone's been broken hearted or fallen in love sometimes so somehow that's gonna hit people yeah it's gonna translate well i want to jump into the track it's three minutes and 16 seconds duncan we got a cool little snare and tom fill uh right at the end of that fill we get a slide in from the organ followed by 16 bars of drums bass <sighs> Is, are these stereo guitars, or am I hearing one guitar slightly panned right that's maybe doubled? To be honest, I can't remember. But it would if it's Loz, Loz played on this, he, he tends to double stuff. Yeah, it sounds like a double, but it doesn't sound like a true stereo double to me. It sounds like it's kind of panned off, maybe two guitars kind of in the same spot panned off uh, to the right a little bit. Uh, to be honest, I can't quite remember. But I do know that we recorded it in... Um, in Lincolnshire, in the in the studio, and we released it on Deceptive in the UK and in on Fat in America, and the two mixes are slightly different. Yes, I, I, I know that half the mixes Fat Mike left, and half of them he changed. I can't remember if he changed this one or not. So. I think he did because Nick Northern was featured on Survival of the Fattest, a comp re released in March of 96. Fat uh, Records used to put these comps out. And right. uh, that was that was one of the reasons we picked this song. I know a lot of people know it. Those comps sold a lot back then. That yeah. was how you found out about your, about your new music. So I believe this was a remix by Ryan Green. Okay. Well, you, you probably know better than me. If it wasn't Ryan Green, then it was Mitchie. Did you guys record live off the floor and just overdub vocals and maybe a guitar part or something? Or how did you do it back then? Back then and now pretty much, we'll always record guitar, bass and drums live with a guide vocal and then add to it later. We try to do it live, no clicks. We, we did do clicks on one album, but on most of one album, but I, I didn't I, I didn't like it. It was like, mm, oh, we'll try mm -hmm. it. And we tried it, but... I'll try and get it live, get it live so that the song moves about a little bit without you yeah. knowing it gives it a bit of life. I think well, I'll tell you something that what you just described is what you guys sound like live. 
You've always <laughs> sounded like you do on record. I mean, and that's that's great for a punk band. Those guitars are super chunky here at the top. I'm just going to call them stereo guitars here on out. And uh, they have the syncopated rhythm. Uh, and the organ is here as well. And at the very end, we hear a two-note trombone slide into verse one. Where's the love is up from me? Where's the love you took from me? How am I supposed to carry on? Just emptiness inside of me, where the flame of love once burned so strong. Yeah, Nick Motown is nicking that idea of emotional lyrics about love. Um, yeah, no, it came from an old failed relationship. It was you just said Nick Motown, which was on the next record. Oh, you sorry, Nick, Nick Northern. Northern. <laughs> I always, I've, I've done that more than once live. People say, "Let's do Nick Motown," and I go into Nick Northern. But like, oh, so I'm, ass- I'm I'm assuming Nick Motown. You you were nicking the Motown sound with that one. Yes, yes, on I purpose. love it. I had no idea, man. This is so cool. Okay, <laughs> um, was this uh, lyric about anybody in particular, a love interest, or were you just just writing? It was, yeah, and like I said, an old an old relationship that went wrong. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to say who. Okay, but, it, <laughs> but Fair yeah, enough. It, it was a yeah, an old love that that fell apart and it, mm, it hurt it hurt bad yeah as it does how how do you typically write for this song if you can recall do you have like a notebook that you jot down lyrics and you can just go and reference that or do you write for the track that's specific for that track when you're writing it most of the time it comes from the melody first i'll get a melody and then i'll start fitting words around the melody so the song is formed or half formed get the melody and then start seeing what to hook onto it and it might just come from one i might have a few lines i do i do jot some stuff down every day i'll write something every day even if it's just one line it's like oh hang on that little sound bite sounded good whatever it was click clack click clack or whatever it's like oh write that down well these days record it on my phone and voice memos but yeah i've always got a portfolio shall i say of lyric unused lyrics but it's extremely rare that I write a lyric and then fit a song to it. Right. It has happened a few times, but it's very rare. Normally, it's the other way around. I'll have get the song up, get a melody, and, and see what it's suggesting, and then start putting things on top of it. You know, something I don't think I've ever talked about on this show, I, I, I want to ask you, you know, I've come up with what I think are really great melody lines, and I'll have them in my voice memo on my phone or something, and then I go to put words to it, and it changes the melody. <laughs> I can't find the right words and syllables to make that melody flow. It is very hard because the melody is it's it's what makes it work right. in a big way. And um and yes, and and trying to fit words to melodies can be absolutely infuriating because, like you <laughs> yes. said, if you change it, if you've got a song going da 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 da, that's the melody in your head. It's like right, I got to think of words. The oh, the, and that don't fit. Oh, the Oh, that's yeah. a hard syllable. I don't want that. The, and then you go, oh, about a oh, woo, 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 woo. It's like, no, that doesn't sound anything like da, 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 da. Try doing it most of your career when you had a drummer that wrote the lyrics. So you'd sit there and you'd be getting to the chorus. You're like, I, I know the word is fine. I know that's what you want to say, but it's got to be two syllables. It, the melody doesn't work. And oh, man, you want to talk about the rows we'd get into. It was just, you know, ah, because he wants his lyrics to be what he wants them to say. I get that you know yeah. but but if it doesn't work melody wise and it's killing the melody which one do you pick yeah it's hard it is hard and then if you do have to change it it can change i, I sympathize with that if you change a word in a in a sentence it can make a massive difference because it might not have the same meaning as before it, right but, but fitting that all in and still making it meaning mean something good and fit the melody that's a I mean, I, I, I know that um, Elton, is it? No, not Burt Bacharach. He writes the songs and the melodies. And then, well, used to. He's dead now, isn't he? I think. Um, <laughs> then he would send it off and someone else would write the words. They would have to fit the words to it exactly. Oh, and I think man, the same I... with Elton John. That's what he does. He just goes, right, I've got this song. It goes, la, 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 la. Another bloke writes the lyrics. So it is that's the hardest part getting the lyrics to fit and still make sense and 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 hopefully mean something that touches someone be it in a good way or an angry way or whatever way it's uh 
it, it can be a bastard getting the lyrics sorted. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it can. Well, this verse one, uh, the progression continues over from the intro. We get organ swells and a two-noter from the trombone after the first three lines. That happens each time. On the last line, where the flame of love once burned so strong, at the end of the lyric, the organ swells, and we get a roar from one of the guitars that takes us into chorus one. The bass guitar here. The tone and what Andy's playing is absolutely killer. It's its own song within the song. He, he was a genius on the bass. He was. He was a brilliant bassist. And I think you said it, you hit it on the head there. He, he would be playing his own song. It's a rhythm instrument, but he's got to pick out the melody. So he's got to be half, but uh, bass should be halfway between the drummer and the song. Playing their own song that isn't, that's adding to, not taking away. Mm-hmm. So, and Andy had that down. He was he was brilliant. In fact, I do remember one time we were recording an EP for Japan, um, and it was a little snippet of a song. It was just kind of a little, a little moddy thing, not pretty similar in rhythm to to Nick Motown, Nick Norvin, sorry. So I've done it again. <laughs> and we were recording it and mixing it, and it all sounded great. And then we soloed the bass, and it just sounded like he was playing a different song completely. Right. It was like, well, that's... <laughs> Is that what you're doing, Andy? Yeah. It's sort of like, it's a different song. It sounds, what? And then you put the whole song in again, and it fits perfectly. Mm-hmm. But it, but when you soloed it, it was like, where is he going with that? But yeah. when you put into the whole mix, it just it just builds the whole thing into something bigger. Right. And and you get some of those people that, you know, I've had, I have friends or, you know, there aren't really musicians say, I don't really know what bass is. I can't really hear it in the mix. They can't discern. They, their ears don't go there. And I always tell them that the, the difference is, is that it, it, the song sounds good with a good bassist. And what I mean by that, I can get around on the bass, but if I were to go play Nick Northern, <laughs> it would sound like me following the root notes. And what Andy's doing is an art form that therein lies the difference. Yeah. Well, he was a big on like old reggae stuff and ska stuff, but he also liked Killing Joke, The Stranglers, darker sort of moody stuff. You can hear that on the first couple couple records for sure. Um, out of verse one, we get into chorus one. <laughs> Where'd it go, that burning flame of love? Where has it gone? How am I supposed to carry on? Yeah, well, it was, that's just me being broken hearted, isn't it? It's just like me, me. It's me, me, me. Yeah, boo hoo. <laughs> I, I, I do joke about soul singers. They're always always moaning, isn't they? Soul singers. Oh, I've got a broken heart. It's like, oh, yeah, shut up, get on with it. I'm joking. You know, I'm joking. But have you ever felt, though, that that. <laughs> That pain, that heartache as songwriters, is that what gives us our best stuff? We've heard that before, and I feel that that's true a lot of the times. I think that's true, yeah. It's a, it's kind of, in a way, it's therapy, getting stuff mm-hmm. out, getting hurt out or getting anger out. You can connect with that when you hear someone else. I remember as a kid listening to Rod Stewart with the stuff like You Wear It Well and Wake Up Maggie. I mean, I, I was a a little tiny little virgin but in my head i knew exactly what he was talking about without <laughs> knowing it was it was kind of like just identifying with it and you can tell if someone means it you can feel it it's like it's not manufactured it's it's meant even if they're singing someone else's song in a way that touches them you can feel it you just took the words out of my mouth how many times has there been a song written and covered by two or three artists but it isn't until you know, the one artist covers it and they sell it emotionally. That selling of the song is you have to feel it. And that comes, I've always said those emotions, that spirituality, it comes through the microphone. Yeah. People can feel it. I think they know if you mean it or not. Hey everybody, we got to take a quick break for a word from our sponsors, but we'll be right back with lots more with Duncan Redmond's. Hey, this is Chris Swinney, formerly of the Ataris and currently host of That One Time on Tour, part of the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. 
Have you ever wondered what it's really like on the road? The highs can be euphoric, but the lows can be crushing. Join me every week as I chat with industry pros about what it's like living out their wildest dream and in some cases, their worst nightmare. Past guests of the show include members of NoFX, Pennywise, Bad Religion, and more. Listen and subscribe at SoundTalentMedia.com. Hey, I hope you're all enjoying today's episode of Krista Makes a Podcast. It's listeners like you who keep us going strong. And the most impactful way to help us keep this show going is to head to KristaMakes.com and sign up for our supporting cast. You'll get weekly bonus episodes of The After Party, where we do fun episodes about music history, classic albums, tour stories, trivia, and everything else you can imagine. Plus, there's an enormous back catalog of these episodes, so we can keep you laughing and learning for a really long time. So yeah, for the cost of buying us a drink because you enjoy Chris to Makes a Podcast, you can help us continue to create episodes with all of your favorite artists. Just head to ChrisToMakes.com to sign up, and from the bottom of our hearts, thanks for listening to the show. And now, back to the show. Well, the uh, chorus comes quick, man. It's 32 seconds. We're already, we're already at the chorus hook. The guitars go to full strum here. The organ and the trombone sit perfectly underneath the vocal. Uh, is the vocal doubled in the chorus? It doesn't sound like it in the verse, but it sounds like it, it could be doubled in the chorus. Again, it's so long ago, I can't remember, to be honest. But <laughs> it, I would, it, uh, it probably is. There is a harmony on the back, which is... I say a harmony. I think it might just be another voice doubling up what I do. Well, it's interesting you say that because later in the song, I hear, and a lot of times you'll do a unison vocal, but a couple of the words will will have a harmony. So there'll be a little rub, which is cool. And I think that's what, what goes on here later in the song. Right. Uh, but I would sometimes double track. I've gone backwards and forwards on double tracking because it does sound better and stronger, but sometimes it just makes it a little bit flatter without the voice being fully felt so I, i'm i'm kind of 50 50 on that it, i did go all the way the other way at one point and i was like double treble you know and it was like once you layer it all up you get a perfect note but it kind of goes a bit flat you again it's back to that you want it to be a little bit wrong in a good way because the ear hears that when it's all perfect auto-tuned absolutely perfect your ear kind of turns off and goes mm, that's good but yeah. if someone can sing it with feeling and like i say just get it slightly wrong and yeah slightly waver about it gives it a bit more weight i think so i'm back to just doing single takes now yeah, I totally get that. And and sometimes it's the the little imperfections that make it feel real and, and exactly, you know, perk your ear up as you said. Verse two comes right off the heels of chorus one. Is it no more the tenderness or too tenderness? Um, no more the tenderness. Um, hang on. I've got to, go, got to remember now. I should have done me homework, shouldn't I? Well, I found no more the tenderness. I'm left with emptiness, isn't it? I'm, I'm left with emptiness. Hang on. I'd have to sing the whole song. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. So no more the tenderness. I think it is, but I might look it up later. <laughs> Be wrong. <laughs> well, that's that's where we're going to go with no more the tenderness. What happened to the love we shared? No more the warm caress, just emptiness and despair. And if you just read these just verbatim, not even that it's a song, just words. I mean, who hasn't felt that? Yeah. I think everyone's been in, There's un, everyone's had love in their life somehow good and bad and it brings you joy and then when it goes wrong i think it's one of the most painful things that can happen okay it's not like breaking your leg and being in that sort of pain but emotional pain it just destroys you yeah you just let nothing works <laughs> nothing you know you could yep. be standing there when i always think when you're in when you're in love you could be looking at a puddle in a lorry park in reading and you go that's the most wonderful puddle in the world when you're broken hearted, you could be standing at the top of the Alps with a beautiful panoramic view. And it means shit. It's just like yeah. nothing, nothing hits. Oh, and it just destroys man. you. It, it's, it just lays you completely, you know, lays you to, to waste. It's just 
It hurts. I was going through a breakup and I stood there front of house by the soundboard at the London Astoria watching Slayer. This would have been back around 2001, 2002. Never seen the band, was totally pumped. And I don't remember anything of the show. I just remember being upset the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Well, it colors everything, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Here I am, a, a dream gig. I've wanted yeah. to see this band since I was 15 years old. And all I could think about is her. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. It's so destroying. It is. Your body just gets obsessed with something and it's gone. And then it's like, oh, fuck. I know. Well, verse two, the band breaks down for the whole verse. Pretty much the same instrumentation as verse one, but I only hear a one noter from the trombone after line one. Then it's just organ. And the organ parts here are different uh, from verse one. So, uh, you know, this wasn't done to Pro Tools copy and paste. So this was just you guys kind of riffing. You know, did you ever say, hey, you know, Dave, why aren't you playing the trombone every time? Or was it there and it, it, it wasn't mixed in? Or how'd that come about? I found that very interesting. I never realized it till I analyzed the song. To be honest, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was, um, yeah, it's before Pro Tools. Although yeah. it, it was done on two inch, so you could still drop in. We would normally just work through the songs and then people would get to their where they felt comfortable and that was it we'd try and record it like that live yeah i, I thought it was interesting because verse one's busier than verse two um it's not like com you know this completely noticeable thing but but you know breaking it down and analyzing it like this i thought that was interesting to be honest i again i'm sorry i haven't done my homework i should have listened to the track and got got all their memories back because if i do it live i'll just go into it and it'll come out but i've got to start from the beginning another artist doesn't doesn't sit around listening to themselves how weird yeah not often <laughs> not often yeah, <laughs> exactly i, I don't uh, I drive down the road listen to less than jake very often unless we get a new mix and i have to test it in the car right yeah uh the other thing here at the last line just emptiness and despair that row that the guitar did in verse one is now the organ doing it the guitar is not doing it there and right. again that's just the way it went down no no one said hey laws get in there and, and make that guitar part happen again it probably would have happened in rehearsals and we'd have got stuck with it. I mean, the the wonderful thing about Hammond is the the whole it's half a percussive instrument. It is in the is. way that you, you make it swell. You make you got this wow, and then mm -hmm. you've got the the Leslie kicking in and all of that sort of stuff. And it does this kind of pre delay thing almost, where you think you're hearing stuff. I mean, I I, I used to listen to Who records. I'm sure you did. Where you'd be in headphones, you'd be like what is this? And it was the Leslie like swirling around, you know, and it yeah. would do these, it would, it would almost make you think you're hearing voices. Yeah. 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 And well, I did just ring an old bell there because it was when we, we were doing the songs, this song in particular, working it through. And like you said, sometimes you can just hear something that's there already, but it's not actually being played. So some, so it was kind of copying. I can hear this, even though it's not there. And it, it's something in the notes, the way they're working together, the bass and the guitar are doing different things. It's suggesting a note. So you can almost hear stuff when it isn't even there. It, it's, mm -hmm. it can be suggested and you'll hear it. And it's, it's like, oh, that's not on there yet. Ah, oh, gotcha. Or whatever. Yeah. So it is trying to pick out the things that are happening already, I think, and reinforcing that. Absolutely. Well, verse two goes right into chorus two. <laughs> We get the same lyrics as chorus one. Where'd it go? That burning flame of love. Where has it gone? How am I supposed to carry on? Same overall instrumentation as chorus one, but the trombone is mixed noticeably louder than chorus one. I thought that was interesting, and I think it's kind of cool. As the song goes on, it's lifting. Do you recall that being a part of the conversation or that happening? Um, I don't recall that actual particular thing, but it is a general thing to try and build up the song so that it gets louder and louder towards the end so that the song hits harder because mm -hmm. the ear once you hear it from the off it'll if it's all the same level it'll just be flat so you do want to drop down in the verse and come up for the chorus and then down again and up so that it builds that excitement builds the dynamics of it whatever 
And it's funny because I've listened to this song, I don't know how many times over throughout the years, I never noticed that second chorus, <laughs> the trombone comes up. It's, it was cool to be able to, you know, learn something about one of your favorite songs. I mean, I guess I've got to say credit to the people that were mixing it, whether it was Ryan Green or Mitty version in the end, it's, they're going to they're gonna know what they're doing as well and think, right, we're going to have to build that, build that, then we, you know, take that back, then build it up again. But it is a general songwriting thing, isn't it? To get it up and down as best you can. Yeah, that, that those those dynamics are again what uh, what can ultimately uh, make or break or sell the song. Quite possibly, my favorite part of the song is the post chorus. I'm calling it. Now I see my dreams burn before my eyes. I see my dreams burn before my eyes. And the second burn before my eyes to to our conversation a moment ago, I can't tell if there's a harmony here, Duncan, or if, if what the organ is doing makes it sound like a harmony there. It's crazy. Um, there is a harmony. I think there is a harmony in there, but burn me before my eyes, burn me before my eyes. Yeah. I think there would be a harmony. It might have been mixed quietly. The organ's doing something there too that's kind of messing with me. And I I rewound that part. It could be that as well. It could just be that it's suggesting something and you're hearing stuff that may not be there, but as a whole, it's doing something. But there is a harmony on that. I love it. And I've always, uh, you know, I've told you this. I've always loved your drumming and the dynamics that you bring to the band. And this section right here, this post-chorus, the whole band gets louder dynamically, especially that crash cymbal. You're just banging yeah, yeah, yeah. on this post-chorus part. Absolutely love it. And then we get into the musical interlude uh, or a bridge, if you want, with no lyrics. And I, I absolutely love this part. The first eight bars are that chug guitar. Jigga, 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 jigga. It's awesome. Halfway through, bass guitar and drum hits. Dun, dun. On bar seven, that drum fill from the top of the song happens again, followed by a whole band reintro for a 24 bar organ solo. <laughs> And you know, Lee, okay, the the keyboardist in Snuff, he can play anything. The guy is awesome. This is a pretty reserved organ solo. You know, it's it's not super flashy, but it fits the part. Yeah, yeah, he's he's done really well there. I think I love what he did on that. His little yeah, tiny little trills, keeping the gaps, and then getting it moving a little bit more complicated. It builds into a lovely little, that's a lovely little solo. It's delightful. It's awesome, but there is definitely more room for him to move around in there. But that space is what makes it interesting for me. And 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 that's blues, Motown, soul. They would always give that space. And that this part of the song is great. I think that this sets up the rest of the song perfectly. It gives you this uh, kind of a lull. But again, he didn't overdo it. He, he played what I think is perfect. Yeah. I think you said it with he's kept the space keep the keep the space in it so that it can be tempting often to overfill th- things and then the the space is lost this is this the space that's making the dynamic so I mean he's obviously influenced by lots of similar you know he's the mod he's not called the mod for for no reason he loves all the old <laughs> mod stuff you know and, um so he's obviously influenced by all that as well if anybody has ever seen lee they know what duncan means by mod i mean he looks like he's walked out of a 1975 party full uh, leisure suit sometimes he'll his hair his chops his sideburns the whole look it's, it's awesome yeah 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 well 64 <laughs> maybe six, 68 64 yeah 68, 68. 75 is a little late yeah 60, yeah 60, that's 60, a little bit late i mean the, the mod rerun and that was one of the notes I was asking Loz. Loz, am I right about this? Did we record this here at that time? Anything else you remember? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lee was wearing a really loud shirt. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. Well, uh, verse three. 
I'm left with yesterday, left with trouble on my mind. No more the warm caress, just emptiness and despair. So you're echoing what, you, what you're what you feeling from earlier. Poor little broken-hearted Duncan, that's what it was. I mean, the relationship was a few years before, to be honest, but it was... Um, it still resonated. It was still there. It's still there a bit now. Though. I still I still talk to her. We, we're friends now. But it was uh, at the time I was just devastated. I mean, uh, Isn't that funny? How sometimes you can take yourself down that rabbit hole of you just be driving down the road and an X will pop in your head and you and I have to like sometimes get myself out of it because you'll start going down those feelings again. Like wait a second, this is <laughs> this is in yeah, the past. Why why am I gone. thinking about this? Yeah, why why am I thinking about this at the, at the, at the stoplight? This makes no sense. Mm. Well, it can take years for a relationship, pain of a relationship to disappear, can't it? Sometimes sometimes you're over it in a few days. It's like, oh, I've met someone else. Oh, who? Oh, that old girl. Oh, oh, I've got a new girlfriend. So it's fine. <laughs> Other times, it just, just hangs in there. Sort of like, oh, if only, if only. Exactly. The last line, just emptiness and despair. We get a huge, the loudest one in the song, on the guitars come in there. It's awesome. And uh, chorus. <laughs> Where'd it go, that burning flame of love? Where is it gone? How am I supposed to carry on? Did you think about maybe third chorus and as you want to get a different line in there, some more information, or did you always have it uh, pretty much the same? With that one, I think I just kept it the same, just repeated it. Sometimes I just can't find anything else that will fit, but it, it, I think it was just reinforced what I'd already got on. That's the, you know, just reinforce it. Go with that. Fair enough. Well, the uh, post chorus comes right on the heels. Again, same lyric as the first time. Now I see my dreams burn before my eyes. I see my dreams burn before my eyes. Love that lyric. And then we get into the outro here. We get double time on the snare. And uh, there's a couple words in here. I'm going to try to decipher with you. I've well, never known. I'm kind of dreading this bit because at the time, <laughs> I did just shout out what was in my head. It was kind of like, and I wouldn't. I never quite settled on it. I always thought this this part was maybe ad libbed. It was a bit ad lib, yeah. It was like I've got an idea, my dreams, my heart, belief. Well, you know, I was just kind of like, right, this is what comes out, what comes out. Here we, here we go. Um, so what's on the record it is not quite what we do live anymore. It was kind of just shout it out. Go on, tell me what you think it is, and and then then maybe I'll nick that and do it. Well. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Um, the next song will be called Nick Chris. Um, yeah. My love, my love, my dreams, believe, my love, my dreams, just down to one. Just how do I carry on? Yeah. Carry on. I swear, tears are just burning away. My tears are just burning away. Yeah. Well, it, it's a mixture <laughs> of my hope, my heart, my dreams, belief. My love, my life, just how do I carry on? I think that's what I've ended up doing these days. Okay, okay. But yeah, I'll, you stick with whatever you like. I still sing the lyrics to the first Clash album completely different to what they actually are. So it doesn't matter. As you should, as you yeah, should. Yeah, if you know the words <laughs> to the first Clash album, then it's sort of like, what? You cheated. Yeah, you're, you're not a real fan. Um, <laughs> the whole band hits together here at the end. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then, yeah. 
then the whole uh, the whole band fades away as you mostly hear the trombone and the organ sizzle out. And I got to ask you, were you doing demos at this time, like on a four track or anything on just a simple tape recorder? Or did you just go into your rehearsal space? You guys would rehearse and jam and then you just go record the songs. We did demo the whole album up in, yeah, in 95. We signed to EMI. And they had demo studio, so there is a whole version of it uh, in demo. No um, kidding. Okay, it is about somewhere. It came out when Demo Must Be Bonk was re-released. It was a little limited edition thing. There was there's a few. We made up a few hundred CDs of it, so there is a whole demo version of it. So yes, the answer is yes. We demoed it in London. Now, am I remembering, before we break here, Duncan, am I remembering the title of the record, the story behind it? I want to say it's like the store just down the road from you where you'd get, you know, get your cigarettes or something. The guy behind the counter, he, he may have been an Indian fella or something, and, and he, his accent, you, he said they must be punk? No, no, no. Well, you're kind of on the right track. It was my, an old landlord. I was living in a bedsit in Tufnell Park, and he was Greek. Okay. <laughs> it was a Greek landlord, and he was saying they must be mad. A strong Greek accent, they'll add noises where there aren't noises, or, or take noises off. Kettle becomes a kettle, and org becomes, organ becomes an org. So it was sort of, they must be mad. It was him saying they must be mad. Demo must have be bonk. Bonkers. <laughs> he just took the end off bonkers. Oh, I got you. Okay. So they must be bonkers in a very, very strong Greek accent. That's what it is. Well, I've always loved your titles. That's been another thing that drew me to your band, the Wacky Titles. Speaking of Wacky Titles, you guys have had eight more studio albums since the release of Demo Masabibonk, the newest being, and, and I'm going to try this, Duncan. I'm going to try. Uh, Go on, then. Crep- Crepuscolo Dorato della Bruschetta, Borsetta, Calzetta, Cacetta, Trombetta, Lambretta, Giallo, Osido, O Cosi Magnifico. <laughs> yeah, well done. <laughs> magnifico, magnifico. That's the latest record in 2022. And uh, as we leave here, first of all, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to to see you, to to hear your voice. Uh, what, what's what, coming what, up? And what's coming up in the uh, world of Duncan Redmonds and Snuff? Um, Snuff at the minute. We've got another album that we're finishing off. In, if it looks at the calendar, in three weeks, we're finishing off an album, whether it's done or not. So there might be some on the spur of the moment lyrics on a couple of the songs, but it's, Love it. it's, it's almost finished. Um, it's got a few acoustic songs on it. We've started doing acoustic. There's an acoustic album out as well, um, which isn't everyone's cup of tea, but it's, it's fun to do. And it came out of a happy accident and... Cool. So there's a new album coming. We've got a few dates. We're off to Germany. We've got a few UK dates, but I think we'll probably be doing a proper tour in next spring with the new album with little gigs put in here and there. We always have a snuff club, we call it. Every Thursday, assuming everyone's about, then we get together and talk shit and make a noise. So snuff club's always ongoing. Just depends on when we can get everyone in the same place and go off on tour. I hear that loud and clear. And how's your uh, three girls doing? Uh, four. four. Or four. Girls. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. You have four. And I, I was, yeah. And, and and your wife makes five. I don't know how you do it. The wife makes five. Dog <laughs> makes six. I'm surrounded by the <laughs> <laughs> And your, your daughter, I mean, I saw one of them last time. I couldn't believe how old she was. They got to all be close to 20, right? Or older? Yeah. Youngest is 18. So there's only oh two gosh. at home now. Eldest, my eldest daughter is head of 30. <laughs> It's, which just does How'd not that compute. Just does not make sense. It doesn't make sense at all. I'm, no. I'm not even 30. How can she be 30? Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, no, there's it's, it's two at home, and they're, they're at university, and 18 and 20, so most of the time it's headphones in, and morning, <laughs> <they're>, <laughs> what? Yeah. As they turn off the, the old iPods. What? I was just saying good morning. It's like, oh. <laughs> and then, you know, but... Ah, we we have a good laugh, and they they ignore me, and that's you know, that's part of being a teenager, a young person, isn't it? So, don't do this, don't do that. But you did it all, Dad. Yeah, I know, but I'm telling you not to. <laughs> well, give give my best to the misses, okay? I will. Yeah, no, so yeah, the, I'll go right downstairs and pass on the love. All right, and the rest of the lads too, man. And thank you so much. I, I love you, man. Thank you. Nice one, Chris. Yeah, and say hello to the chaps. <laughs> Go.
We've been wanting to make that episode happen for a long time, and I'm glad it finally did. I hope you all enjoyed that conversation with Duncan Redmonds, but don't go anywhere. There's lots more Krista Makes a Podcast coming right up after a few words from our sponsors. What's up, everyone? This is Jay Reason, and I want to let you all know that Diablo Zen Podcast is now part of the Sound Talent Media family. Listen in as me and the one and only Danny Diablo, a.k.a. Lord Ezak, interview artists from the hardcore punk, metal, hip-hop scenes, and beyond. We have conversations with guests like actor Peter Green, DJ Muggs from Cypress Hill, L.A. street photographer Estevan Oriole, Jimmy G from New York City's legendary Murphy's Law, and pro wrestler Vampiro, to name a few. If you're a fan of good discussions and lots of laughs, tune in and join the fun. As we near the end of the show... Here's a band you might not know. Welcome to this week's band you might not know. If you'd like your band to be considered for Chris to Makes a Podcast, all you have to do is email your best song via MP3 only and a short bio to band you might not know at gmail.com. This week's featured artist is Borrowed Sparks, an Americana punk rock band from St. Louis, Missouri. Their latest record is called Let a Little Light In. You can listen to their music on Spotify. Here's a snippet of that title track. Let a little light in. The North Star fades and glory days. Where they burn out at dawn. There's a golden hour, a red sun rising. Gotta let that North Star fade. What you want is new horizons. The Rap with Chris and Chris. Chris, I thought that was a really great episode. I've always loved that song, especially from Snuff. Now, I'm from the generation that came up with the Fat Records comps. You know, those Fat Records comps, those were like albums in themselves. Like, you know, I had to have those things memorized from start to finish. And Nick Northern was such a different track from everything else on there. It had that... Motown feel that you brought up, which I guess was actually Northern Soul in England. That's what they were nicking there. I didn't know nicking meant stealing. I thought yeah. that was a really cool little tidbit from this episode too. <laughs> yeah, if you yeah, hey, he nicked me wallet. You know, he, 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 someone stole my wallet. Yeah, that's uh, definitely uh, ve- very English. I had no idea that that was the, that's what the title was was referencing. Something <laughs> I told him. He, here it is, twenty seven years later. Huge fan of the song, and I'm I'm learning stuff about it. And man, I had to reel myself in when we started here. I, I've you know told Duncan many a night years ago um and and I remember one day waking up and the guys are like dude you cornered Duncan last night when you had a few <laughs> too many beers you know I mean I would super fan on this guy um they were my band you know nobody knew who snuff was back in 1991 they were just this I didn't even know who they were I just had this worn out cassette that I played a, a billion times um and that's why we got into punk rock it was it, it wasn't for the masses it wasn't on TV it was you know you, you had a uh a, a, a personal connection to that band and oh my gosh I, I i gave a little bit of the backstory with them but i i could have went on about that for an hour just you know I'm, I'm still a super fan yeah hey i still have the flyer from when less than jake played at club laga in pittsburgh with snuff opening yes snuff and all yep i still have that flyer what a show wow it was <laughs> they and snuff had flown over that was the fall of 1998 they had flown over their first show was in Roanoke, Virginia, of all places. And they had never seen Less Than Jake. We had never met them before. You know, I'd only seen seen the band two years prior, but I didn't meet them or anything. And I'll never forget Duncan telling the story. Like, that's when we'd invite audience members up. We'd have 10, 12 people in masks and costumes running around, throwing stuff in the audience, jumping off speakers. And he's like, what did I just witness? He was like, it was like the Jim Rose circus show mixed with like a, you know, a, a ska punk band, you know? And, um, we hit it off with them immediately and built just a, a wonderful, wonderful friendship. Hey, I think that it was kind of not talked about that much that Duncan is a singing drummer. He's <laughs> yeah. a lead singer drummer. You didn't, I mean, that's pretty rare. I know 
jellyfish had that and once in a while you'd see like i went and saw the eagles play and don henley did that a little bit maybe you saw phil collins do it once in a while but Mm -hmm. yeah you don't see that very often i feel like that was kind of glossed over in the episode the amount of coordination that it takes just to play drums i mean i'm impressed by drummers to begin with now add singing lead on top of that it's it's kind of a feat it is and and again i didn't know anything about the band you know we didn't have uh uh google at our disposal in 1996 and i go see them play and i was just as amazed i'm like that voice that insane crazy voice is coming from behind the drum set that voice i've been listening to at that point for six years and i finally got to see the band and 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 see him yeah he's phenomenal his drumming is incredible and um i can't play drums let alone even think about singing and playing drums at the same time yeah Hey, that Motown slash Northern Soul influence is so apparent in their music. They even did a cover of the Four Top song, Standing in the Shadows of Love. And mm-hmm. it's those minor key Motown songs yes. that have that sort of dark feel. That's kind of what Snuff sounds like. That's such a perfect cover for them to do. It makes so much sense the way it lends itself to Snuff sound, you know? Absolutely. They... Again, they took a lot and he, you know, he was, he was going deeper than just soul and Motown records. You know, he was talking about stuff like the faces, Rod Stewart and, you know, getting those compilations that his, his older sister would bring home of Motown stuff and immersing himself. You know, I, I remember thinking that, you know, all these punk rock guys, when I was meeting them, like that's all they are is punk rockers. They never listen to anything else. And it just couldn't be further from the truth. None of us were born punk rockers. Like you know, I was listening to Neil Diamond when I was five years old, because that's, that's what my parents were listening to. So it's really cool when you get a band together and we've talked about this before. It's everybody's influences. You start changing band members and you're wondering why the band doesn't feel the same. It's because we're all unique. I thought another really interesting part of this conversation was the discussion about the integrity of the melody versus the integrity of the lyric. Mm. And maybe you can make a deal with yourself if you're doing both. But when you're, <laughs> I know in your situation where you're you're trying to make the lyrics fit to a, a melody, and that's not always easy to do, especially with consonant sounds and vowel sounds and just trying to stuff a lyric into a melody doesn't always work. And I'm sure you could have that same battle with yourself. Mm -hmm. If you write a set of lyrics that you really love and you don't want to lose the message of the lyrics, but you just having trouble making that fit to a melody and then vice versa. Mm -hmm. You have this melody you love and no matter what lyric you try to force into it, it just doesn't work. I think that's like a very common problem to have as a songwriter. Oh, yeah. And everybody interprets words different. So there you are with the lyricist sitting down as a songwriter and you're coming up with the melodies and you say, well, I know this word, you know, means a bunch of different things. Can't we find one that's two syllable? And then the lyricist will look at you and say, yeah, but none of those words mean what this word means. This is kind of unique. They kind of mean the same in conversation, but not they don't mean the same of what I'm trying to articulate in the song. Then your argument's completely blown to pieces. You have nothing to stand on. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and then right. and then you're like, well, where do you go from there? Yep. And also I thought that it was a cool thing to bring up the way that writing songs and getting stuff out of you, and it doesn't just have to be in songwriting form. It could be any sort of art, but that it's a form of therapy. And in my life, and I'm not saying that just because you do art doesn't mean you shouldn't go to therapy too if you feel like you need to or want to, but it's been an outlet for me since before I even knew what it therapy meant yeah, <laughs> or, or whatever. So it is one of the um, fortunate side things of playing music that you have a way to get the stuff out and sort of get that therapy through songwriting, through playing music, through performing for other people. You, you get to release these feelings and it's just, I don't know. It's always been a really good thing for me. Heck yeah. And I'll tell you, give me and Chris a follow on Instagram. I'm less than Christy. He's at Chris Fafalius. And uh, yeah, go subscribe to my YouTube page too. Lots of great content. Chris is always putting cool stuff up there. And I want to thank this week's guest, a longtime dear friend, awesome musician. Can't say enough about him. Duncan Redmonds from the band Snuff. And we'll see you next week. Do you like to laugh, geek out on music, and learn all about that band or artist who had that one song back in the day, but then seemed to fall off the face of the earth? If so, you need to subscribe to One Hit Thunder. 
Together with an array of interesting and hilarious guests, we do a weekly dive into one-hit wonders like Eiffel 65's Blue, Krayshawn's Gucci Gucci, EMF's Unbelievable, Delamitri's Roll to Me, Los Del Rio's Macarena, Musical Youth's Past the Duchy, and even Patrick Swayze's She's Like the Wind. So are you subscribed to One Hit Thunder or what? As Desiree would say, you gotta be. And as K7 would encourage, you gotta come baby come and join in on the fun of the One Hit Thunder podcast. Mad Magazine. Advertising mascots. B-movie posters. And cartoons. Oh yeah, can't forget cartoons. If you get the funky connection that ties these pop culture gems together, you'll dig two designers walk into a bar. See, we're a couple of creatively curious pals living between the bookends of grand museums and dive bars. Hey, you know the place. The sweet spot where highbrow and lowbrow become drinking buddies. So join our barroom chats as we talk influential work and uncover stories of how the familiar became iconic. Think behind the music for the stuff we love. Check out our website at two designers walk into a bar.com and listen wherever you get your podcasts or visit evergreenpodcasts.com.